The world was on the brink of war. The Greeks and the Trojans were about to fight the 10 year war because Helen had been stolen by Paris. Paris, the Trojan prince, had stolen Helen away from the Greeks and this started the 10 year Trojan war. This story starts on the eve of that war. Agamemnon, the great war general, was leading his fleet of ships to sail to Troy from the Bay of Orlis. And at the Bay of Orlis, all of the ships were waiting. All of the army, the men were waiting, raring to go, raring to sail their ships across to Troy and recover Helen and, and fight the Trojans and return victorious. But as they waited at the bay, all of the ships, the fleet, the military ready, led by the great Agamemnon military leader. The winds were completely stagnant, not even a breath, not even a, a, a tiny bit of wind. It was completely still. And so no ships could sail. And the men were raring to go. They were frustrated and angry and all they wanted to do was to fight their war. But they were frustrated, impotent in the face of the weather. They couldn't get to their warring destination. And Agamemnon prayed to the gods and said, gods, what are you doing? I'm meant to be fighting this war. I'm meant to be leading my fleet across the waters from Orlis to, to capture Helen and to win the war. And the goddess Artemis, goddess of hunting, said to Agamemnon, sorry, Agamemnon, you showed a huge amount of arrogance earlier in your life when you boasted at being a better hunter than me. And now this is the cost of that hubris, that arrogance, that boastfulness in the face of the gods, stepping over your mortal status and trying to elevate yourself to the status of a grandiose god by boasting that you were a better hunt, hunter than me. And therefore, I have taken the winds away, said Artemis, the great huntress, virgin huntress. She said, the winds will be completely stagnant unless you sacrifice to me your virgin eldest daughter, Iphigenia. And then she left Agamemnon to work out his dilemma. And Agamemnon paced up and down the shores of Orlis, frowning, full of deep sorrow and conflict. On the one hand, he had to lead the whole Greek fleet to Troy. World politics was on his on his head, on his hands, in his hands. And on the other hand, his firstborn daughter. And he was racked with conflict. And as he paced the shores of Orlis, the fleet of Greek army men were getting more and more impatient, and more and more angry. The army were raring to go. They didn't know what was holding them up. And Agamemnon, went into his tent and he heard all the men shouting, come on, come on, come on, we need to go. Then he made his decision and he called a messenger and sent his messenger all the way back to Argos where he lived, where he was, his palace was and where his daughter was with, with his wife. And he sent a message to his wife Clytemnestra, the queen, to say, Send our daughter Iphigenia here to the Bay of Orlis, for she will be married to the great warlord hero Achilles. And off the messenger went, and Agamemnon had made his decision. Meanwhile, at the palace, Clytemnestra was with her three daughters and her son in the palace waiting to hear a message whether the Greek fleet had set off and how the war was going. And as they saw the messenger come, they ran out to find what the news was. 
And then they received this message from Agamemnon to send Iphigenia to this grand wedding to, to marry Achilles, who was famous across the lands for being the most incredibly powerful hero. What a privilege. And Iphigenia, the oldest daughter, was told that right now she was going to leave her home. Her mother was going to take her and to ride across the lands to the Bay of Orles for an extremely unprecedented special wedding, a wedding like no other, in front of the whole Greek fleet. Her father was going to give her away to Achilles. And they dressed Iphigenia up in her white wedding robes, her saffron scarf, she was given all the, the beauty, the beautiful fragrances and the, the riches to get her ready for her wedding. All the women around her prepared her for this extraordinary day. And then they had to say goodbye as Clytemnestra and Iphigenia went up into the chariot to ride across to Orlis to this extremely unique wedding. She had to say goodbye to her sisters and her brothers and her whole family in her home and across to a faraway land to meet her husband Achilles at this wedding in front of the Greek army. And as they approached, Iphigenia was, was holding onto her mother in the chariot, excited and not knowing anything about what her future was going to be, but just this idea of Achilles and to be married in front of this Greek fleet by her father. She was nervous, yes, but she decided that she had been the chosen one, that her father had chosen her to marry Achilles right at the beginning of this war, right at this extremely auspicious moment. But as they were approaching the army camp at Orlis, Clytemnestra, the mother, Iphigenia's mother, Agamemnon's wife, began to get slightly suspicious. She started to feel uneasy. She started to feel something's not quite right here. But she didn't know what, but she just had a feeling of uneasiness in her bones. And as they approached, they started to see the crowds of the military, the crowds of the army, the incredible grand fleet at this beautiful bay in Orlis, and they felt the eerie stillness in the air. They felt the absolute lack of wind, the complete stillness, and they saw the sea as if a fixed lake, not a wave in sight. And all of the ships were grounded and all of the men were raring and raging to go. And then Agamemnon, saw his daughter and his wife approaching in a chariot. He had built an altar in front of the crowd, in front of the whole army, next to the sea, in, in front of all of the boats. What a grand scene this was. And Clytemnestra accompanied her daughter to the edge, through the crowd, to the edge of the altar. And as she let go, of her daughter's hand, she heard some whispers in the crowd. Some rumours had gone out into the crowd that, that Clytemnestra overheard. That this was not going to be a wedding. That Achilles had, had no notion of it, the, the supposed groom. In fact, Achilles was nowhere to be seen. People were asking if Achilles was in his tent. People were asking, what kind of wedding is this? And then the rumors swelled in the crowd that this was not gonna be a wedding. This was gonna be a sacrifice. And as the word sacrifice reached Clytemnestra's ears, she yelled, she ran up to her husband on the altar and said, what wedding is this? You will not take my daughter anywhere. Iphigenia, stand back while well, I see what the situation is. And Clytemnestra confronted Agamemnon and asked, what kind of wedding is this? And where is the groom? And then in the corner of her eye, she suddenly saw 
the instruments and the rituals, the ritualistic instruments for this for a sacrifice. And suddenly her whole body knew. And she screamed and she shouted and she flung herself at her husband, said, you will not touch our daughter. And then Agamemnon explained to her, Clytemnestra, this is an, a privilege for our daughter to be sacrificed to the gods. We're about to fight an ex extremely, the most important war in history. I cannot get to Troy unless I sacrifice my daughter. Because Artemis, Artemis, the great goddess Artemis wants the blood of our child and then she will return the wind to this bay and the Greeks can sail across to Troy and fight the war that we are fated to fight. And he, he told his wife to, to stand aside that this was what was going to happen, that he'd made his decision, that it was it was Artemis's decision that this was the fate that he needed to follow, that Iphigenia was lucky, that she was privileged. She was the chosen one whose virgin blood was needed to precipitate the catalyst for the war being able to start against Troy. And Agamemnon said to Clytemnestra, move aside. And he reached to his daughter, dressed in her, her, her wedding gowns, the young virgin Iphigenia. He didn't really know what was going on. She, some rumors had reached her ears. She heard her parents fighting. In the end, she just became mute. In the face of the army watching her, hundreds and thousands of men watching her, and there her father on the altar, and her mother crying, yelling, shouting, saying, please, please take me instead of her. She, Clytemnestra prayed to Artemis and said, let me die instead of her. I offer you my life instead of her. My blood, take my blood for my husband's wrongdoing, for my husband's arrogance that has offended you. Take my blood instead of my daughter. But Artemis said, no, the blood that must be spilled is Agamemnon's virgin daughter. And Clytemnestra was pushed aside. And Iphigenia walked mute up to her father, not believing, not knowing, trusting that her father, after all, her white robes. And as she went towards the altar, still expecting her groom, Achilles, Agamemnon looked at her and said, Put your neck to the side. And as he lifted up his sword, he stabbed her in the throat. Some versions say it was in the chest. And the men were watching and the men were raging to go. It was a spectacle, a wedding turned sacrifice. There never was gonna be a wedding, the lie of the wedding the marriage with death at her father's hands and in front of everybody, if a Janiah falls to her death, like a sacrificial victim willing at the last moment, she said, take me, I die for the people. And she became like a sort of, well, a, sac a sacrificial um, victim. And some myths, some versions of the myths show, show her going willingly when she realizes what's going to happen in order to sort of keep some sense of her agency or dignity. It's just her mother that's screaming and shouting and trying to stop this, this, this absolute atrocity, this murder, from, this sacrifice, human sacrifice from happening. And the, 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 um, the army just become this kind of audience of this spectacle of the daughter's death at the hands of her father. As soon as the virgin blood is spilt into the still waters of Aulis, suddenly the wind starts to blow and the sails of the fleet of the ship start, start um, flapping around and the boats get their momentum and the whole Greek fleet sets off 
away from that altar, that murderous marriage sacrificial altar where the daughter sacrifices, is sacrificed by her father. The father's sword enters into the daughter's throat in front of his army so that he, he can have a gateway, an opening to fight his war. And Clytemnestra, defeated, destroyed, rageful like there's no rage you can even it doesn't even you can't express in words the rage the sorrow the absolute sickness of the fury she felt and she went back to her home and for the 10 years that the greeks were away the agamemnon was away leading that fleet leading that army in troy for those 10 years she mourned and she brooded with her rage and she plotted to kill him for killing their daughter. Never did she forgive, never did she forget, never did she recover. Her whole 10 years waiting was to wreak revenge on the husband that killed her own child, first daughter on the pretext that she were to be married. Angry with herself that she had believed it, angry with herself that they wouldn't, that she couldn't stop it. And on his return, when Agamemnon returned victorious, the Greeks won after 10 years. They got Helen back and they took Troy down. And as he came back, the great victorious warlord, Clytemnestra, pretending to be the loyal wife waiting for her great husband's return, pretending to embrace him, offers him some, as he comes back from Troy, offers him some beautiful red rugs to step down from his chariot onto the red rugs. Take your shoes off, she says to him and step down on these royal regal red rugs, befitting for a god. And Agamemnon, he hesitated and thought, the last time I behaved like a god, I was put in a terrible situation. He had to sacrifice his daughter. Something in him, however, seduced by these red rugs that his wife was offering him. He just fought the 10 year war. Everyone was treating him like a God and like a king. And down he stepped onto those red rugs. And as his bare feet touched those red rugs, a different fate was sealed. Clytemnestra's plot was finally unraveling. And along those red rugs, he, he, he came nearer and nearer and nearer to Clytemnestra, his wife, this homecoming, this great homecoming. And she lured him down the red rugs into the palace and said, I've prepared a ritual bath for you on your amazing homecoming, victorious from Troy, come. And she pulls him into the palace and outside the, the people can, can hear as the doors close, they can hear some shouting, something going on. Yes, Clytemnestra had waited 10 years to kill her husband and she kills him in his bath and comes out onto the altar and the platform and says to the people, mark my words, I killed Agamemnon because he sacrificed our daughter in order to win a war, in order to go to war. He put his warmongering politics and his power and his ego before the life of my daughter. And so Agamemnon dies after 10 years of, of fighting at war and coming back victorious. He dies at the hands of his wife, at home in his bath. 
showing himself to be foolishly arrogant and full of hubris, even after all of that, stepping down onto the red rugs, offending the gods again. This myth is just really fascinating to me, not only because of the, the drama of it, the absolute sort of extraordinary plot, and I've only told you a really bare, bare bone of it. It's, it's really outlined um, fully in the three plays called The Oresteia by Aeschylus, but it's a famous myth. But often people don't realize that the Trojan War started with this sacrifice. And it's really, really important to, to think about the significance of this, this notion of the virgin blood that starts the war. And not, not just the conflict that Agamemnon's given, a bit like um, Abraham and Isaac, um, not just that conflict of having to, to think about what to do. You know, the, the God is saying, sacrifice your child um and or, or you won't or you won't be able to go to go to war i mean so it's, it's different from abraham and isaac because it isn't just sacrifice your child to prove your faith it's saying sacrifice your child if you want to go to Tro troy and win this war because of this this thing that artemis was doing was saying i will keep the wind stagnant so that you can't go so the, the blood is almost like a it's like a sort of catalyst um, that allows the narrative to start. So the virgin blood, it has to be virgin blood because when Clytemnestra, the mother says, take me instead of her, take my blood. That's not good enough. They need, they want virgin blood. And what's the significance of virgin blood? The only association we will, would have to virgin blood is two associations. One is like the, the, the blood that, that, that the sort of mythical breaking of the hymen, you know, the virgin blood. It's almost like that, that that's the sort of linked also to menstrual blood of the that the you know that young young woman which is implied in relation to the Iphigenia's virgin firstborn getting married and so just this this image of of the the white wedding dress um the the, the sort of flowing robes of the young woman and the blood spilled being the significance of what kind of blood it is and it's specified this virgin blood that it's like sort of the the menstrual or breaking of the hymen it's all about um fertility um generativity and that this is the blood that, that 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 punctuates the beginning of the trojan war and it's not just any blood you know his wife it could have been also difficult for him to have to sacrifice his wife but it's his daughter that they want the, the gods want and it's because of this specificity of this particular type of blood which links to to um to, to fertility and generativity it's almost as if the the, the male fleet of of, of the the warlord and his 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 men need to kind of appropriate or, or take or rob something generative and creative from the blood of the young girl in order for the winds to come and for the trajectory to begin but what i really want to say apart from also the obvious like brutality of the fact that agamemnon produces this spectacle you know the fact that it's so public as well that and, and this equation between marriage and death that it's it's set up as a wedding so symbolically that's so interesting especially with the the sword in, in the neck or the chest that the sort of blood uh, and the color the colors that are described of the red on on the on the white dress sort of associations to the, the breaking of the virginity it's very sexualized when you read the actual text in in Aeschylus's uh, first play which is called Agamemnon it's very sexualized this daughter in the context of marriage thinking she's going to meet her husband and her groom instead of Achilles is, is, is death but also at the hands of her father's sword so it's all very sort of um, incestuous and sexualized and violent and brutal and very vivid with this um I, this, this whole spectacle of, of an army as the kind of voyeuristic audience to this um incestuous kind of marriage to, to death at the hands of the, the the brutal father with the mother as the only agent in the whole myth that's trying to stop this that's trying to to to, to prevent this 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 ritual this this sacrifice of, of her daughter this murder of her daughter at the hands of her father happening and and she fails um because it's just her against all of these huge um like military warlords and and, and the whole fleet nobody is is willing to, to help Iphigenia and Iphigenia herself is so 
shocked and in disbelief and just trusts her father that she just becomes muted and just goes along with it in a state of complete shock, I, I imagine. Um, but the, the, what I really want to say, mainly apart from just to tell this tale and to remind people that the Trojan War it is, is, um, is made possible by this, this sacrifice of the, of the daughter by the father and that the father, Agamemnon, has a choice. He is given a choice. He doesn't have to. Artemis says, if you want the wind to break and allow your ships to sail to Troy to fight the war, so if you want to fulfill your trajectory as a hero, as a protagonist, as a military leader, then the cost of that is that you have to spill the blood of your firstborn. And it's his choice. He makes that choice. Even after his wife pleads with him, even after he sees his daughter, he makes that choice and he follows through with it. But not what I want to really say about this, the main thing I want to say, because I, I, I could say many things. I, I find this story so powerful and disturbing and upsetting and, and intense in so many ways. There's so many things to say, but what I really want to say in this video is that the mother, Clytemnestra, from the beginning, never ever gives, um, stops protecting her, her daughter. Yes, she fails, but she's completely, never is complicit. At first she is duped. She doesn't know what's going on. She starts to get a, a bad feeling about it as she nears the camp. She starts to hear the rumors. And as soon as she finds out, she tries to, to get her daughter to get, go as far away as possible from, her, from the father, from her husband, from Agamemnon while she fights out this, this battle. Clytemnestra offers her own life in place of her daughter's. She will do anything to protect her daughter from this brutal, violent father. She fails because she's overpowered, but she is never complicit. She is never a bystander. She is never watching in silence. And after she has to witness her own failure at saving her daughter, after she has to witness the abuse, brutal father killing her daughter in front of her eyes at the Bay of Orlis, she spends 10 years not being complicit. She spends 10 years plotting revenge, even though that revenge is not going to bring back her daughter. What that revenge is doing is saying to the world as she clearly makes her speech as queen after she's killed Agamemnon on his return from Troy. She clearly says, I killed him because he killed, sacrificed my daughter, our daughter. That's why I'm killing him. Now, whether or not, you know, you know, it's the eye for an eye justice that was happening in that, that um, particular context in this, this myth but that there was a, an eye for eye system of justice, revenge justice, which, which it, it is not really the point in what I'm trying to say, whether it's right or wrong that, that Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon because he killed their daughter. Symbolically, it's absolutely crucial. Symbolically, it's profoundly key and a message that needs to be got out, that this mother stood by her daughter right to the end, was never complicit with the patriarchal abuse that exchanges women between men and, and sacrifices them. You can think about it literally as actually killing and abusing and harming violently the daughter, or you can think about it symbolically of the exchange of women between men for the greater good of the male patriarchy and fighting wars. If you think about it, the desire of Agamemnon was to fight a war. So he kills his daughter and spills the specific virgin blood in order to, to sail to shed a whole lot more blood, 10 years worth of, of blood of killing Trojans. So this is a, this is a violent warlord who's, who's, who's whose task is, is to kill and murder. Now, Clytemnestra is the mother who symbolically says no to that. And her 
myth has never been forgotten. It's recycled down the centuries in all different ways. I'm going to talk in another video of what happens to Clytemnestra and the kinds of cultural um, recyclings we have of this myth where Clytemnestra is demonized actually. And in fact, her motive is forgotten by many scholars and many retellers of this myth. And so I want to retell this myth to remind everybody that Clytemnestra killed Agamemnon, the great warlord of Greece because, and only because, no other motives at all, other than the, the, the main thing, which is to punish him and to say no, and to send a message out to, to the world, to say no to the sacrificial violence that he, um, he, he, he had perpetuated on his, on, his, on his daughter. And so she is the mother that says no to abuse, that is not complicit. And, and that's what Clytemnestra's act needs to be remembered for, that she stood up for her daughter, even though she lost. She lost her daughter and she lost the battle of trying to save her daughter. But that's what her act was to do with. And it's not often, and it doesn't go without saying, it's not inevitable that the mother would would fight against the father to save the daughter. It's not inevitable at all. And so she is exemplary, she is crucial. What she stands for is the mother that says no to the violence from the father against the daughter. And so let's remember Clytemnestra like that and bring back her convictions. Thank you.